Mijuxus, everyone. Welcome to First Foods. Uh, my name is Desiree Kane. I'm a Miwok Two Spirit living in Arapaho Territory in Colorado. Okay, so <laughs> hi everybody. Welcome to First Foods. My name is Brooke Rodriguez. I'm a Taino mom living in New York City in Matinecock Territory and just welcoming everybody back to First Foods again. And uh, we're just going to go over some housekeeping rules as we normally do. Um, with regards to protocols and disclaimers for the program. Oh. Uh, I'm sorry, I got a new computer and I have to actually, I can't share my screen right now. So Brooke, you might have to go through and just read them. Okay, yeah, we'll just go through them and read them really fast. Uh, let me just pull it up. Or I have them up if you'd like me to read them. Yeah, that will be good too. You could go through them. Okay. So the first food protocols are as follows. The first is land acknowledgement. Uh, we recognize, we, ah! <laughs> we recognize, uphold and respect native nations and their life ways above all else as the ruling governance of Turtle Island and Abiyala. Everyone attending the space must uphold the same. Native knowledge. Um, lessons learned here are not for non-natives to monetize or repackage it as their own. Native knowledge systems belong to the cultural communities they come from and to the guest instructors in our program. Intertribal space. Uh, remember that we are all from different nations and regions, so what may be odd or undesirable as food to you might be good to someone else. Please respect that and don't insult or belittle. Respect tribal food, land, and medicine sovereignty. And remember that a majority of foods are shared by many different tribes that may have different names. So do not try to claim exclusivity or copyright for your own people. It's okay to share the name as you know it, it is not okay to create descent over a different name. Uh, we don't do blood quantum or more Indian or Indianer than you uh, fighting in this space. So we ask that you just please respect that it's an intertribal space. The next one is foraging and harvesting. Please always seek permission from tribal communities to forage and harvest. These medicines or foods may be seasonal or being left to replenish themselves. Also respect if the answer is no. Next is food sovereignty. First peoples have the right to hunt, fish, forage, and harvest in their traditional territories. It is unacceptable to critique traditional or contemporary dietary styles as a non-native. So if this applies to you, please don't do that. And then finally, a disclaimer that first foods is for educational purposes only. So before using any herb or plant for medicinal or culinary purposes, please consult a physician, medical herbalist, or suitable professional. So today um, we have James Calabasa. Welcome to First Food, James. A, this is a program led by and made for Indigenous people and our allies who are ready for a new day for old ways. We'd like to thank our partner, Ibex Puppetry, for the ongoing support as we build this program that makes critical knowledge available from the culture bearers that hold the oldest knowledge on the continent, something so many of us need at this time. So a little bit about James is he's an enrolled member of the Santo Domingo Pueblo, and he grew up with a passion to support indigenous communities. As a first generation college graduate from Colorado State University, he strives towards educating others about the importance of higher education, community resilience, and cultural preservation. After working in the government sector for a few years, James realized that his heart belonged to the nonprofit world. He works for a Colorado-based nonprofit called Trees, Water, and People as the National Program Coordinator, where he works closely with tribal communities on developing community-led initiatives that will strengthen their communities for a healthier future. As a proud Indigenous person, he understands and experiences firsthand the hardships and struggles that affect Indigenous communities across the country. 
Following his passion and spiritual education from his community elders, his vision is to educate and empower the warriors of tomorrow, all while respecting and honoring our ancestral roots. So welcome, James, and take it away. Thank you, Desiree. Um, it's, it's an honor and a privilege to be here with all of you this evening. You know, I hope uh, everyone is doing well, you know, amidst this pandemic crisis. You know, I hope that everyone's loved ones, family members are all doing well as, as we kind of continue to kind of roll the coaster through this, like I said, these past couple months, you know, that has really shifted and brought unprecedented times and memories for a lot of us. So I just wanted to open up and hope that you guys are all doing well. Um, I like to formally like introduce myself in my native tongue, um, if you all don't mind. Um, um, so yeah, I, um, like Desiree said, I am from Santo Domingo Pueblo, New Mexico, one of the 19 Pueblos in the state, you know, uh, my family um, is, has been here for generations, you know, and we, we have lived off the land and I'm very proud to have and carry the last name of Calabasa, you know, it's a very unique last name, it's, it's very, uh, how can I, fruitful to know that like a lot of people have really passion that my last name comes from a really unique history of the Pueblo cultures. And I'm just really honored to be here with you all today. Um, today, I'm gonna be discussing with you all and kind of giving you kind of an idea of the traditional Puebloan um, preservation and storage systems and techniques that my ancestors have utilized for generations on harvesting and storing like fruits, meat, uh, fruits, meats, vegetables, or any other type of like berries and cherries that grew locally in our communities. Um, so with that, I'm gonna actually share my screen, you know, and then we'll get going. So like I stated, you know, my name is James Calabasa, hail from Santo Domingo, Pueblo, New Mexico. Um, and today's lesson is gonna to touch base on traditional Pueblo and preservation and storage techniques. Overview of what I'll be kind of discussing today through the lesson plan is uh, I'm gonna kind of take you all through a history of the Pueblo and farming and agricultural sector in the Southwest United States. Uh, we're going to touch base on the traditional Pueblo and harvest and strat like um, techniques and strategies that kind of go through in terms of like how we process our foods. And then I'm going to explain on the ancestral food curing, preservation, and storage of these foods that we harvest and how we utilize those foods in the future. And then we're going to talk about how you all or everyone in the public can be able to use these techniques and strategies for your own harvest goods and harvest uh, ways that you guys are currently planting in terms of like your own little farms, gardens, or uh, any type of permacultural um, exercises you guys are doing. And then we're, I'm gonna touch base lastly, is like how can we utilize the technology advancements and today's kind of new ways in designing new effective models and strategies for future, future utilization and how it could become more efficient with it. And that at the end, you know, I will hopefully have some time for some questions, you know, and I'll be more than happy to answer them, you know, to, to the greatest of my knowledge, you know, everything that I will be teaching today is uh, what I've learned from my uncles, from my father and my grandfather, you know, I am, um, I, I lost the generational lineage of like what generation I am as a Pueblo farmer. Uh, my ancestors have historically been farmers along the Rio Grande River. So history of agriculture in the Southwest, you know, the Pueblo pe Puebloan people stretched across the vast area of the Southwest, you know, in current day New Mexico, Arizona, Colorado, and Southern Utah. The, the Pueblo people seem to like stay very close to like water sources, you know, especially because 
it is very important to have water if you are planning to be uh, farming and doing any type of agricultural work. The main crops that the Pueblo people grew and harvested were the three sisters, such as the corn, the beans, and the squash. Um, these are to this day still very culturally important to us. You know, we, we have our own special process and ceremony of how we plant and how we uh, cultivate and how we harvest these species for, our, for feeding our people. The Pueblo people, you know, like through history, you know, they have designed and developed unique dry farming techniques uh, because we are, they are settled in the Southwest, you know, which is a semi-arid semi to arid type of environment. So water source was, uh, was very uh, scarce at like in most areas that the Pueblos are settled in right now. So they develop really cool, unique techniques that are still being utilized to this day for dry land farming. It wasn't until the arrival of the Spanish, you know, in like the 1400s or the 1500s that um, the Pueblo started to diversify a lot of their food crop, you know. Uh, traditionally, you know, the corn, the beans, and the squash, the three sisters were the main components to the Pueblo diet along with wildlife. But when the Spanish arrived, you know, they brought different uh, non-native species seeds such as watermelon, chile, potatoes, and sweet peas to the area. And to this day, you know, our people, the Pueblo people have been able to kind of adapt to the new non-native species and we harvest that as well. And a lot of farmers actually grow uh, non-traditional foods in their croplands. So this is a picture, you know, of what a historical Pueblo farm looked like, you know, before like irrigation canals, before technology, before tractors were even invented. You know, the Pueblo people farmed in very small plots. They uh, they knew they didn't have the manpower. They knew that they 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 couldn't expand and like they really circled around a water source for these type of dry land farming. So this picture just shows, you know, them making little kind of raised beds or kind of little square blocks for planting, you know, because for them to be able to hone the, the water source that they had or the limitations of it, they, they wanted to make sure that like they could carry on something that the water would be able to hold on for a long time, especially in the Southwest where um, water precipitation and the annual rainfall was very low back in the day, you know, but due to climate change, you know, that shift has really uh, provided a lot more rain in the past, like 50 years or so for the Pueblos. But I just wanted to show you all like this is historically what a Pueblo farm looked like back in the day. In today's day, you know, uh, the Pueblo still use their traditional and ancestral farming techniques. We use a, a row crop system where we use our irrigation comes specifically from canals or earth dams where we just use uh, the water as a means to irrigate the fields. This field actually here, as you can see, is a is a good measure is a good measure to how most Pueblos uh, irrigate their cornfields, you know, they do it by rows so that it's allowing that water source to kind of fluctuate back into the soil and then allowing these crops to kind of really take in and absorb as much as they can because the Pueblo people knew that like you can never predict when the water, the, the rainstorms were going to be coming through, you know, so they wanted to make sure that they inundate their crops with the, an abundance of water so this type of row irrigation was very important to the techniques and strategies that they developed. And as part of the traditional kind of farming and harvest ceremonies that the Pueblo do, you know, wild game was very important to, to their diet. You know, they had to balance out uh, and get some protein, you know, especially if we're gonna be working out in the field in the hot blistering sun all day. So a lot of Pueblo uh, tribes uh, were dependent on like the wild game for as a protein source. And to this day, you know, the Pueblo people still hone that kind of creativity and that unique passion to honor the wild, the wildlife as a means to succeed and also to be successful in their life. So 
that was one unique way that they balanced out uh, the idea of dry land farming and also being hunters in an area where the, the creator gifted them the gift, um, gift of wildlife. Now I'm going to talk about the traditional Pueblo and harvest, you know, so harvest in the southwest, you know, depends on species, you know, like I stated earlier, you know, the, the traditional three sisters were the main crops that were planted, cultivated, and also harvested, you know, pre pre-technological -technolo advancement, you know, those were the three main crops, but for the, in the past 50 to 100 years, you know, the diversity of crops have really changed the diet to how Pueblo people um, are able to harvest their foods and store them and preserve them. Um, but more traditional species such as corn, you know, the Pueblos have a unique and special process that they still practice to, to this day where they must wait for approval from what the war, local war chief to harvest. And that's just due to like being just kind of reciprocating the ancestral roots and the ancestral kind of practices of how the Pueblo people tend to harvest their foods. They just needed to wait until the war chief and his staff uh, made it clear that like, it's okay to start harvesting your crops, specifically corn. And during these Pueblo and harvest ceremonies, you know, families come together to take part, you know, so it's not just, uh, and it's not just a time where you're out in the field, you know, it's an opportunity for the families to come together and be, be happy and be thankful that uh, a harvest was able to kind of happen and take place because you can never predict, you know, what type of season you're going to come across during the su spring, summer, and into the fall. So this was a great, uh, this, this is a great time for families to come together. During the harvest sessions, you know, men and women have their own unique roles, you know, roles. Men are the ones who are out there in the field, you know, every day, making sure that the crops are growing, that they're taking and putting as much effort into them as like they are like keeping the family safe and healthy. So the, that's what the men's roles are in the harvest. And then women also have their unique roles as well. They, they're the ones out there giving the blessing and they're also being thankful that uh, the mother earth has given us this harvest that they can now celebrate. So these are a few photos, you know, like of some Pueblo, families, you know, down in New Mexico who are harvesting different crops, you know, during the fall season. This actually here is the harvest of sweet peas, you know, a, a, a species that was never really unique or native to the New Mexico or Southwest area, but the Pueblo people have really thrived off of it as a good commodity group. You know, they, they harvest it, they, they preserve it, and then they store it for future use. Here you have more of like what you would call a traditional corn harvest that you would see in the Pueblo way of life. And as I mentioned, you know, it's a time and opportunity for families to come together. And these are actually pictures of my family, you know, that's my grandpa out there in the field, you know, he is 81 years old and he is still uh, working hard every day, making sure that like we continue practicing our traditional uh, ways of harvesting corn and being respectful to the earth, you know, because this is the earth who's giving this food to us. So we want to be able to be make sure that we are thankful, but we also want to make sure that like we have the youth involved because they're the future, future ones who are going to be reciprocating this knowledge and this traditional values to the next generation. Um, so these are very important uh, tactics and ways that the Pueblo people still practice to this day. So corn, you know, this is, uh, this is the most important um, species or food crop that is unique to the Pueblos, you know, just because it's used in many different forms other than foods, you know, it's used for cornmeal, husks are used for uh, tobacco smoking, you know, by the elders and the men. And then also for making tamales, you know, I know I love tamales. So like, I, I'm really glad that like the Pueblo people have this unique tradition of being able to utilize the corn husk for and the corn itself for so many, for so many re, uh, ways and reasons. So curing and preservation techniques, you know, 
the Pueblo people like have been living in these the Southwest for, for hundreds, maybe thousands of years, you know. So they've used the advantage of time and their local resources to to understand how to cure and preserve their foods that they harvest and also the meats that they were able to harvest like from wildlife. One of the biggest things that, uh, the biggest factors that they utilized was the natural elements for curing. You know, they used the sun, the father, they used the sun, they used uh, the wind, they used the exposure of earth, you know, the adobe block as means for curing food, you know. And then with the Southwest, you know, being a very high, um, high altitude country, you know, they just really made that area very, really appropriate for using the sun to cure and preserve food. And then they understood that like having a holding system is vital, you know, having somewhere to be able to put out like your corn that you just harvested or put out your chiles or put out your uh, beans, put them on something that like where you can be able to make sure that it fully dries and cures, you know, because one of the biggest things that the Pueblo people uh, have learned is that like if you don't, if you, if you can't fully cure or dry your harvest out, the mold, then it starts to mold, then you start losing out on your crop, you know, like the moisture gets to it, but it also provide, it also brings like bacteria and harmful like diseases. So that's, uh, so the way they strategized it was like, you gotta be able to have a, a great holding system such as like a rack or an area where you can just lay out your harvest on a hot surface and let the sun and the wind and other natural elements do the work for you. But they also realized, you know, pests and flies was a big contributor to spoilage and to bacterial infection. Um, they, they used typically, you know, like potteries as a way to like hold these foods and to kind of cover them away from pests and flies. Um, and this, to this day, you know, we, we've learned that from our ancestral knowledge and the transmission of it, that these are very important modes of actions that we take. And my family, you know, and others throughout the communities and through the Pueblo still utilize the lessons that our ancestors uh, taught us. Um, but the most important thing is timing. You know, you can never rush um, the idea of curing or preserving food. You know, you gotta let it take its own course of action. You know, because during the like harvest season, you know, you can never predict if it's going to be a nice sunny fall or if it's going to be a rainy fall season. So timing is very important. You know, the knowledge to the Pueblo people is that at least you want to have as much sun exposure or at least a lot of wind exposure as well, so that it fully dries and cures these uh, these foods that you harvest. This here. On the left, on the right hand side is a picture of um, a traditional blue corn harvest out at Cochiti Pueblo in 1908. As you can see, you know, they, they have their corn scattered, scattered all over like the ground, you know, with the husks off. What they're doing here is they're curing that corn so that they, so that down the road they can shell it and get it off the cob and then store it and preserve it in a storage unit for for making bread, for making uh, different products, and then also for trading. You know, the, the Pueblo peoples in New Mexico have had a long history of trading blue corn and other types of um, harvests with the Hopi tribe and also the Zuni out in uh, Western New Mexico and Arizona, you know, just because the Hopi people, like they've, they live in such a really hot area that like water source is very scarce. Um, and to this day, you know, a lot of families still practice that uh, traditional exchange of trading food and goods with one tribe and another. And then on the picture on the left, you know, is what um, currently how we still uphold those curing techniques that uh, the Pueblo people have been doing for, for hundreds of years. You know, we, we take off all the husks, we take 
we make sure that like the corn is exposed in a nice sunny area or at least there's like a wind draft coming in to make sure that the kernels are starting to dry out and then uh, like then shell them off in and store them into like a pot or a jar or something that will keep the longevity of the corn for a very long time. And this is another system that the Pueblo people use, you know, like some, some tribes, you know, it differentiates through, through the Pueblo people, you know, some people and some tribes like to take the corn, the husks off completely and dry it like that. And then some people like to actually use the husks and tie them up and hang them, allowing that wind to kind of use, allowing the wind to kind of come in and drying out the corn. And for most part, you know, the, what we call the colored corn down in the Pueblo, the Pueblo areas, uh, it's used for decoration. You know, it's used for as a means to help preserve our culture and the traditional values of it, but it's also used as a food source. So there's so, so many different types and uh, ways and techniques that the Pueblo people have utilized curing and preservation of corn. Here is a harvest of what we call the pinto beans, you know, we, um, the Pueblo people, you know, have historically grown this crop and harvest it within the fall spectrum, fall period. And what they do is they pull out the root, the full plant, you know, even the, the root, and they place it out in an area that has a lot of sun exposure, allowing the crop to, to dry out. And then what they do is these bean pods start to like pop and then most people like in the Pueblos, you know, they will take a broom or take like a shovel and start hitting on it, allowing these beans to kind of drop onto like a trailer or an area that like there's a catchment system for the bean pods to kind of be disposed of. Um, so it just, it takes some time. It takes a lot of effort, you know, but they want to make sure that like their foods are fully cured and fully dry. And one way that they know that their the pinto beans uh, is dry is like when you step on it, the the pods break easily, you know, and it just drops the seed onto a catchment system. So they they've understood and utilized these types of systems, um, and they they're learning how to like really further develop and advance it to like to a point where like it could be even become like second nature to them. Here, you know, like we, you would typically, when you hear New Mexico, you know, you hear about the chili, the green chili and stuff like that, you know. Um, but the Pueblo people also plant a lot of it and it goes along with their diet, you know. They, they utilize red chili a lot for stews, for, for peppers and for other different reasons. So for as a preservation um, asset as well. But as you can see here, you know, they hang them up, they, they they get as much sun exposure and a lot of wind draft as well. So they can, these peppers and these pods can start to fully cure. Cause if you were to put these pods in as picture right now, as they're still moist, they're gonna end up becoming warped and moldy. And then you're gonna lose out on that crop, you know? So most farmers in the, in the region always say, you know, like, I don't wanna, I don't wanna lose out on this after working like so many hours out in the field. So they really take um, the idea of curing and preservation very seriously in the Pueblos. Here you have a traditional native tobacco curing technique, you know, as you can see, you know, they hang them up in a cool shady area, but allow the wind to take care of the curing process. You know, they bunch them up together. The reason why they bunch them up is just because the, the leaves get so vulnerable and so like they can break off easily, but once they're bunched in together and there's a high wind draft come through, they can kind of stabilize each other. So that's the reason why they bunch them up like this and instead of like separating them, but it typically takes about two weeks for a, for a tobacco leaf to fully cure, um, use, utilizing the traditional Pueblo ways of curing and preservation meat, you know, like the Pueblo people had to, they realized, you know, like that when you, when they harvested like a large wildlife animal, such as like a, a buffalo or a elk, you know, that, that had an abundance of food. So they had to find ways to be able to preserve the meat. 
the one technique that they used was uh, they would trim majority of the fat off. And because the Southwest, you know, has a, has very hot summers and low humidity, it was pretty, is a really good environment to be able to hang dry uh, these meats, you know. And as you can possibly see on both pictures, you know, salt is the main preservative. You know, they would drench the meat in tons of salt and also utilize like flakes of red pepper to kind of preserve those meats. And then once the meat was fully dry, they will wrap it up with either sheep skin or uh, like uh, deer skin and stuff like that as a means for preservation. And this is technically, this is still being used, utilized today, you know, by a lot of families who can't afford, you know, like refrigerators or can't, or don't have a place to uh, store meat in a cool area, you know. So this tradition is still very heavily used in the Pueblo people um, because, you know, it, salt has become a big uh, preservation method for them and it's very cheap. And that's, uh, it's a good way to utilize and practice the, like what our ancestral people did back in the day. So now I'm gonna talk about like storing and preserving harvest foods and seeds, you know, like the, the ways that they, the next steps that they took after curing and preserving the food, you know, the next step was like, how are we gonna store the foods that we harvested or the meats that we were able to kind of uh, cut up. Like, what are we going to do now? So the main component of it is like storing in a cool, dry location is very, is essential. You know, it's, it's important that like, excuse me, that in the, in the, especially in the Southwest, you know, with those hot summers and the low humidity, you want to be able to store it in an area that is very cool, but like does not get any moisture or there's not any type of like heavy air conditioning blowing in that kind of room or in that like preservation area you know you want to try and eliminate any exposure to water you know because with water specifically with corn you know like one little drop of water you know they, they tend to like germinate and they start to regrow you know so a lot of the Pueblo people actually put their harvest um, in a very cool dry location that is kind of out of reach with any type of water. You want to also make sure that like foods or seeds are cured enough before storage. You know, that was the main component of why timing is important to understand like when the when your harvest or your foods are fully cured, you know, because you don't want to put in uh, a chili pepper or a corn that's still moist because eventually it will become uh, what do you call it, rotten or and eventually spoil as well. So the Pueblo people have used these techniques to make sure that the before storing them and preserving them for future use, they make sure that the foods are fully dried and cured enough. And then they use closed containers or barrels, you know, those seem to work the best, you know, but back in the day, they used like pottery. Pottery was the main storage device for the Pueblo people to collect the food and store it in there, you know. But in today's kind of society, you know, co closed containers or barrels are seem to be the best method of it because they they can hold a lot more and that also be, that they have lids, you know. And that really just helps with the preservation of these foods. And most importantly, you know, you want to keep the food away and closed from mice and rodents. Um, when the Pueblo people, you know, when they're storing blue corn or storing any, any type of corn, honestly, you know, it attracts a lot of these mice and rodents into their homes, into their sheds. So closing it up really well is very important to make sure that you don't have any rodent problems or rodent issues in the future. Um, that's why like the closed containers and barrels are the best kind of like items to utilize for storing and preserving these foods. So you here, you know, you see traditionally Pueblo women, you know, harvesting, you know, the corn, you know, they're taking the, the, the shells off the cob and then they're gonna eventually store it into what uh, typically what we call pottery, you know, and then from there, they, they try to hide it up in high areas or areas that has a lot, so ha has a lot of sun exposure. As you can see in the picture on the right, on the roof there, you know they have small little kind of uh, pottery containers that 
are hosting this, like holding the seeds, but it's also a way to keep, keep away from rodents and mice. And here, you know, for maybe those who may not know what a pottery looks like, uh, this is more of the newer kind of new age designs of pottery. Uh, but typically this is what the storage unit for the Pueblo people look like. They would harvest their food crop and then store it in these containers, um, sometimes with or without a lid, you know, and that's what made it very difficult for them to be able to like preserve their foods through a long period of time because it's easily accessible to water and to any type of flies, rodents, and mice. But in today's age, you know, jars have seemed to become the best uh, measure to storing food um, and any type of seed, you know, like this here just shows a picture of the seed storage for, for a family in the Pueblos. Uh, but what they do is like they grind down the seed kernels into like masa or even into a cornmeal. And that's the way they make like tortillas and different types of food groups. Um, so closed containers seem to work the best in today's age. And more pictures, you know, of different ways that families uh, are like um, storing and preserving their food crop and seed is just using like closed lit containers like this, you know, and then just labeling them, making sure that like, you know, which crop is which, or for anyone who's coming to visit might not know what this seed, seed is or what this food group is. Um, it's, it's like important to make sure that like you have a label on them. And then some families actually use like gunny sacks, you know, they use gunny sacks as a storage unit or even bluebird sacks, you know, from the flower company. I know my family, they used, uh, the bluebird sacks for a very long time and they still do to this day because it's breathable it's allowing some more uh airflow to come in but it's thick enough where like it doesn't attract a lot of mice and rodents and them able to get in there you know so there's so many different ways that the pueblo people have learned from their mistakes and how they've really advanced their storage unit uh techniques and strategies So now like I wanted to kind of touch base on like how can you use these techniques, you know, to store and preserve your foods, you, you know, utilizing the Pueblo, uh, the ancestral and traditional ways that they've done so in the past, you know. Um, the first thing is you want to be able to design the best curing and storage techniques that are best suited for your environment, you know, like for the Pueblo people, you know, fortunately they were in an air environment that had a lot of sun exposure, but that might not be the same like if you live out in the Pacific Northwest or out in Alaska, where it seems to be a lot more cooler and you don't have a lot of sun exposure, but maybe another factor to it could be like if you get high winds. You know, you want to be able to make sure that like you utilize the best natural element in your environment to cure and preserve these foods so you don't get any spoilage or any type of waste associated with it. Um, you want to also have a good storage room to keep foods preserved. You know, you want to be able to make sure it's in a cool, dry place somewhere like in your house, in a shed or anywhere that you want to make that you know it won't get too hot or too cold you know for for uh, the seed preservation or this food preservation you know you want to make sure that like you can kind of have a stable room temperature or so while these uh, foods are being stored and preserved you also want to mark the date when you store certain food groups, you know, because certain food groups have a shelf life, you know, what is what we would call shelf life. You want to be able to utilize it, you know, within a, a matter of weeks and a matter of months, you know, like some food groups aren't able to kind of hold on for a very long time, such as squash, you know, squash, you know, it can, it can be preserved for at least up to six months from like what we've learned in my family, you know, utilizing the traditional storing and preserving techniques. But after like that six month period, you know, it's they seem to kind of get a little moist and they seem to like start to kind of see signs of mold on it. So you want to make sure that you mark the date when you store them in like a closed container and just kind of routinely check in on those storage storage conditions and how they're doing because 
you don't want to just store them and then forget about them you know like just like any other thing you know you want to make sure that your food is is being well preserved and that it's you're seeing no signs of spoilage or no signs of mold going on um, because like I said that those these are things that the Pueblo people had to learn from um, uh, generations ago and then to this day you know we're we're fortunate that we have like technology we have better um, conditions we have better like attributes that help suit us to make sure that our food is being more preserved than they than they it was back in the day so if you like designing new effective models you know if you're if you wanted to like some like somehow design a curing or a storage method that the Pueblo people have utilized for generations. You know, you want to be able to like realize that like use your resources, you know, you that's what the Pueblo people did. You know, they used the natural elements, you know, they used their resources that were free to them. Um, so in terms of like preservation and storage, you don't want to go out and like buy tons of equipment and just like, I don't know, like you not utilize what you have at hand. You know, you want to be able to understand that like you have the sun or the wind or any other type of natural elements in your area. And this is uh, important to realize that like you want to make sure that like if you design uh, an effective model for you to use, you know, like use your resources, make it low cost as much as possible. And that's how the Pueblo people to this day are still utilizing uh, their storage techniques. You know, I've seen really unique ways that the Pueblo people have designed uh, curing protocols. You know, they make racks, they use the old like bread kind of, uh, what do you call it, carriers that has holes in them and they dry their corn on there. And that's really a unique thing to utilize, especially if it's laying around your, whole, uh, your house. You also want to look into maybe implementing technological techniques, you know, like if you have uh, a, a refrigerator, you know, that's something that's new and advanced to this age is like, if you think like, I just don't have the capacity to be able to hear this food or preserve it, like utilizing um, the old ancestral ways, you know, like look into possibly combining that technological techniques such as a refrigerator or air conditioning as a means to preserving your foods. And think about it as in like a built up and not out concept, you know, especially if like you are limited to space and you just don't have tons of uh, room available to be able to kind of throw all of your harvest out in an area that you want to like utilize your sun, the sun or the wind, you know, like think about making like a like a multi-layer rack or like a post, um, sorry, well, I'm trying to think of that word. I just lost the word. Um, or holding system, there we go. A holding system that's multi-layered. And so you be able to st uh, store more and preserve more instead of going out. And then also think about like long-term investments, you know, think about like, if I build something, you know, like how long will this last for me? You know, how can, how, how many years into the future can I utilize this concept or this design to uh, preserve and to store these foods so that I don't have to repeatedly go out each year utilizing more money and making it much more uh, high in terms of like financial cost to, to make it happen. So, I mean, this picture, you know, is just kind of like an illustration, you know, this is kind of like the end goal in terms of like what we hope to accomplish in terms of like harvesting, preserving, curing, and storing our foods, you know, like these here are traditional like Pueblo uh, foods. And this is what they, this is all like a whole holistic model of that every stage in that model has to make sure has to take place effectively before we get to this end goal you know you want to make sure that the beans are harvested correctly you want to make sure they're cured the blue corn as well you know like because you don't want to be able you don't want to feed your family any type of spoiled or warped out blue blue corn kernels so it's these this is just kind of like uh the visuals of the end products that the pueblo people strive to accomplish you know and hopefully you as well as a uh, indigenous farmers or 
uh, just like permacultural activists, you know, you want to make sure that like you get the idea of storing and preserving your food so that you can enjoy a meal like this. And then that's all I have. I wanted to just kind of end with this in terms of like showing you all like the end goal of it, but I can, I can uh, further expand more on the idea of preserving um, different foods that I, I have seen in the Pueblo uh, techniques and strategies of it. I just wanted to kind of hone more on the three sisters as that seems to be more of the unique strategies that the Pueblo people have taken um, in terms of like preserving and storing their foods. Well, that certainly was informative and made me so hungry. <laughs> <laughs> totally. So thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Um, is there anybody with comments for James? Hey, hey there. Um, thank you very, very much for that informative <laughs> presentation. I, I learned so, so much. Um, my question is this, considering um, basically what you were talking about, the Pueblos and many of the South, the Southwestern nations and so on and so forth, would you think these traditions such as the Three Sisters, would you say that it would go back to say the people who are known as the Hohokam? Because from what I understand, the, the Hohokam were, that wasn't their, their, their name, but that their, the, the people that are now the Hopi were, were alleged to be them. I don't, I don't know if that's true or not, or could you please, if you know any, anything, could you please elaborate on that? <laughs> yeah, of course, you know, I, I know that like, the Southwest has a unique history of so many like tribes and even into present day like Mexico, you know, so there was a lot of cross cultural exchange happening, you know, a lot of tribes and a lot of nations just kind of like exchanging ideas of what worked for them and like what didn't, you know, uh, uh -huh. but to kind of go to your like question, you know, like, yes, like, I'm sure like the Hopis, you know, have been connected to that kind of ancestral people as well, because they do, they do a very similar type of dry land farming, but like it also differentiates a little bit, you know, maybe that's something that they've learned from a different nation or just kind of utilizing what they had in their environmental area in Arizona. Thank you very, very mm -hmm. much. I shall bow out. Thank you. <laughs> I have a question, James. When when you first started and you were giving us an overview of what you, how you were going to present uh, your story, um, I found it really interesting that uh, you said before before you can harvest, mm -hmm. uh, you had to get approval from the local war chief. Mm -hmm. Now I'm curious as to why the war chief would be the one to give the approval and not a mother or an, uh, a female mm -hmm. elder unless they're war chief. Um, yeah, like that's a, that's a tradition that has been going on for, for generations, you know, for hundreds of years, you know. I can speak on behalf of my Pueblo, you know, Santo Domingo. Um, so yeah, that's still currently being practiced to this day. And to my knowledge, you know, the, the way that they structured around it was because the war chief and their staff also plant for the people, you know, there's individual families who plant and they, they work with their spiritual guidance, they work with their ancestors, you know, through prayer, through ceremony for them to for, for them to like let the war chiefs know that like it's time for harvest, you know, we have blessed your crop and they are now in full bloom. It's ready for, for them to be taken off and to be preserved by the people. So that's my knowledge of like how and why the, we have to wait on the, the war chief to give us permission on harvesting because he is the one who is uh, in the most connection with our ancestors and to like our creator through prayer and such. So like when he gets that approval from them, we are we have the approval to start harvesting. Mm -hmm. So are, is your tribe uh, 
patriarchal or matriarchal? It is matriarchal. You know, we uh, we inherited our the clans and our names through our mothers, and so it is heavily dominated by the matriarchal side of things. Um, but the mothers, you know, when it comes uh, planting season, they have a very important role. Uh, I shouldn't say mothers, fem uh, women have a very important role because they're the ones who give birth to the seed, you know, that the men then go out and plant into the field. So they're the ones who are giving life into back into the farms. And they're the ones who are planting uh, the, like the seed of life, you know, the, and giving birth to it. And then the men, what they do is they take it and they start planting it into the farms. Okay, mm -hmm. that sounds good. Well, I kind of like the matriarchal system in your tribe because it sounds like the men do all the hard stuff and the women, mm -hmm. yeah, that looks good. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks for the questions, Christiana. Uh-huh, thank you for answering. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> um, is there anyone else with any questions? We've got a little bit of time left and we've got a number of people on the call. You're welcome to uh, just ask popcorn style. Um, we did have a question though on the, uh, in the class in our group, which was for James. Were the pots that Pueblo people used for storage heavily decorated? I think I saw you post a picture of just beautiful ones, right? Could you maybe share that one more time? Yeah, of course. Let me share my screen, you know. And those potteries that I shared, you know, are more of like the new age designs, you know, that the, a lot of Pueblo tribes and a lot of Pueblo artists are starting to like put these graphics on them, you know, but um, from my understanding, you know, the old, like the old style was more like plain. It was more used for like just holding foods and like as a storage unit, you know, but it started to kind of uh, grow, you know, the idea of decorating them, you know, um, has really transitioned through the years. But even then, you know, like I have seen old potteries from like the 19 early 1900s that did have some graphics on them uh, but this is kind of like the new age of pottery with this photo right here to my understanding mm -hmm. okay yeah those are beautiful and then um i myself I'm, I'm not a pottery maker but i do under i do know that like it's a very unique process as well like uh, the pottery makers you know they go out they gather a very special type of dirt, you know, to make sure that it holds and it like bonds really well to make uh, beautiful pieces like this, you know, and it's really unique to the Pueblo, Pueblo people, you know, for many, many reasons, you know, uh, but it is a very uh, unique process itself in making these pottery um, and how they structure it and how they educate the younger generation into understanding why they do it. Mm -hmm. There's another question. Is anyone storing seeds in pots today? Yes. Uh, I, I know my family, we store uh, some our white corn seeds in a pottery, you know, like the pottery itself was made without a lid, but we, we use the technological advancements of today's age to kind of design uh, a lid for it, you know, so it keeps out the mice and flies and everything else from it, you know, so that was kind of like when I was talking about like combining today's technology with the ancestral ways of preserving. So that's what we utilized was we had an old pottery that didn't have a lid, but then we, we made our own lid. So make sure that there was not any type of rodent or mice exposure to it. I have a question too, since you're talking about um, sometimes using new technological techniques uh, to, to blend with the old. I'm curious, these, these pots in this photo are so gorgeous. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know that for Star Club, for the cult of Star Club, that we have um, machines now that will actually 
uh, quilt them. Uh, if you set, you know, you can set a design and you get the design mm -hmm. of the of the uh, quilting that you want. Is there any kind of computerized stuff that's used for these? Because this, or is it done by hand? Because this is incredible stuff. Mm -hmm. I honestly do not know. I am not. I cannot really answer that question to the fullest of my knowledge. You know, uh, uh, that would be something I can maybe even do some research on my own because it is very detailed. It is very just yeah. the graphics of it. Uh, uh -huh. I know the a potter in my community tends to do all of his graphics by hand, but I don't know how other Pueblos and other pottery makers utilize um, the graphics, you know, if they use any type of computer design work for it, you know, maybe having like a layout and then they sketch it in. Um, I, uh -huh. I don't know that, um, fortunately, that I can't really answer that question, Christina. Well, I will come down to visit you at your office and you... <laughs> and we I can talk know. about it. Totally. <laughs> I'd be more than happy to. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Uh, it's Phoenix. Hi. I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so my question is... Um, you know, um, you didn't always live, you know, with the access to a lot of land to mm -hmm. put things down. Like when you left your home and stuff, you live in apartments and stuff like that. So when it comes to like applying, what what kind of traditional techniques have you applied in an urban setting on your balcony, you say? Mm -hmm. Can you give me, give me examples or how to use them? Because see, I'm living in, I just found out I don't live in zone 10. I mm -hmm. live in like zone 13 which is the hottest, one of the hottest zones out there. Mm -hmm. So um, like what would be applicable outside right now? Cause I'm in 140 degrees mm -hmm. two days ago. Yeah. So what kind of things can, can I do? <laughs> Sorry, just... On a hot balcony. Yeah, totally. Um, so like say if, you, if you're like living in an apartment unit, you know, and then you have like a balcony or some type of deck, you know, that you will be able to kind of uh cure your harvest out there you know like hanging like mm -hmm. say if you have corn that you just harvested you know maybe hanging in it you know tying up the husks and hanging them that would be a good measure of doing so because like you're you're using less resources you know like having to go out and buy like a rack or something to store it on mm -hmm. instead you could just kind of hang them over like like a ledge or something and then just let the sun do its work you know but if like you're looking at things that don't have anything to like tie itself up on like corn husks um the process that i used once you know here in fort collins was i i kind of went to like an old bakery and i got like one of their blue pans you know i don't know what you would call them but like they would put like loaves of breads on them and i got a couple of doughs and what i did was i just kind of took a bucket of the food that i harvested from a small garden and I just threw it on there and I just kind of scattered the, the food around and then put it outside on like a deck and just kind of put it out there each day from like the time the uh, sun comes out to like the evening before it starts cooling down. I, I, I bring it in every day because in the area that I live in here in Colorado, it, start, it seems to get uh, a lot of moisture at night, you know, so the, one of the things that the, you want to make sure that you don't get any moisture into, like back into those, uh, into the crop, especially if you're trying to cure it and preserve it. So I would take it out every day, you know, like say eight o'clock and then bring it back in like at five or 5.30. But I would just kind of like utilize what resources I had or what's just laying around at the house and just kind of scatter them out there like in an even, on an even layer and just kind of expose it to the sun as much as I can. And then I will also, after like a week or two, you know, I would like try to flip them around, you know, it's, it's hard to kind of realize like which food crop has been exposed to the sun a lot, but like just to kind of like flip them around, you know, roll them around, make sure I that- I think you'll know because when you flip things around, like uh, especially when you live in a really hot area, I think mm -hmm. the, the bottom part will be softer and the top part will be harder. Yeah, yeah. totally. That's yeah. how I kind of gauge it. Even if they both, even if they look like evenly shriveled, like mm -hmm. just touching it, I can feel like the bottom is softer, the top part is 
harder. But my other question is, say you have, well, first off, what size were you able to grow um, in an urban setting? So the, um, I, I did some farming in a community garden in Fort Collins, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't land that I owned or anything. It was just kind of like a neighborhood garden that like I had a certain plot that I planted like um, Pueblo chili and then also some Pueblo beans and like one stock of corn, you know, so I had a good harvest from it. And that's uh, from what I was able to harvest. I had maybe like maybe two, two, three pounds of beans and then like to like, like maybe three uh, ears of corn, you know, so something small, nothing too big, but like, that's kind of like something. That's a lot from, of beans. How yeah. big is this space? It, I had a 10 by kind of like 10, I would say, max mm -hmm. kind of plot, you know, oh, to farm and that's stuff. So, and I used uh, like a row uh, planting technique, you know, and so when, like I said, that harvest came, it was about like three pounds of beans and stuff like that. But that's what I then layered out in back of like my apartment at that time to uh, utilize like the old traditional ways of curing it. Okay. So mm -hmm. from your guesstimate, how many, um, how much corn do you think I could plant in a 70 gallon plant pot that's like maybe one meter wide? One meter wide? Okay. Yeah. 70 it's about one meter in diameter it's a circular you know plant okay pot. yeah um are you looking to plant like the more of like the the traditional uh, uh, hopi, corn? hopi blue corn oh hopi, blue, hopi blue, corn? blue corn i would probably probably say five because the reason why you know like the way i was taught you know like if you plant one blue kernel into the ground you know and it, it starts to germinate and sprout eventually, you know, it, it starts like kind of having kids of its own in, in, in like what they tell us, you know, like it, it brings more the small life. ones at the bottom. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. and, and then they get tall, you know, they get very tall. So, and then mm -hmm. you want to be able to make sure they have spacing as well, like just so they could breathe during that time. So I, that's my estimate is maybe five. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. All right, so that makes sense. So in a, okay, for that, would I, you think I would be able to add some beans and and, and the squash in that? Would it, would it be enough space or would it choke it out to try to grow them together? I mean, it wouldn't because the, the beauty behind the three sisters is that they're like, they're pretty drought resistant. Like they can thrive like with limited uh, amounts of water. So like, I think that will work perfectly. You know, if like you plant like a, uh, and kind of do like a like a checkered board system, you know, like corn here, and then in between the next corn, you you, you grow mm -hmm. a, a pinto bean, and then corn, and then a squash, you know, just to kind of change it up and diversify mm -hmm. it because it will also help with the roots, you know, like to the, the diversity of it, you know, it'll it'll, it'll mm -hmm. grow stronger roots and grow a stronger plant. So I think it will work if like you do like the three sisters in the area like that. Okay, I'm, I'm asking because uh, soon enough, I'm going to empty out one of my, I have a third um, plant pot, 70 gallon plant mm -hmm. pot with a one, one meter diameter. And I was thinking about putting corn and stuff in it. But for me, around maybe end of August, middle, middle to end of August when it cools down around here. Okay. So I was thinking about that. But then I have two other plant pots, okay. same size. So I was like, maybe if I did it in two plant pots, you know. That you know that would that would work out, mm -hmm. but I don't think I would get too many beans at least for the household. But that's okay because I only got two people here anyway. Oh okay, yeah. I still, I mean, the three pounds of beans that I was able to harvest, you know, it lasted quite a, like a, a long time. You know, just because you know it's it's a lot, and I don't eat beans all the time, but it was just good to have you know there as a so I don't have to go out and purchase it. You know, like I was able to like harvest it from my own hand, so it felt the beauty behind it felt great. Yeah, I bet. I'm good. Well, thank you for the questions. Hey, good well. luck with your uh, farming system. I, I hope it all goes well. I actually had my, I have some Pima, some autumn tomatillos that I got seed from Gila River and Salt River, two, oh, okay. two different types. And I planted them in one of my big plant pots. And they're doing great and all, 
even in the 140 degree weather Ooh, yeah. and they're in direct sun, <laughs> like they stood it. It's just when it got really, really hot the other day, I had to just water in the afternoon because that was like mm -hmm. a little too hot for them. And they lost two branches because the winds was really high. I think we had like almost 40 mile per hour wind from a dust storm recently. Uh -huh. And it, I thought they would blow over completely, uh -huh. um, but it didn't. Only like three branches fell off. Okay. And I rooted those in water and I'm gonna grow them hydroponically indoors in a bucket. Oh, okay, nice. Mm -hmm. that, that would be really awesome to see. You know, I, I have never seen like a uh, blue corn grow in a hydroponic type of system, you know, just cause typically yeah, they get very tall. tall. They get very tall, yeah. you know? So it's just like, I'd be interested to see how that will work out. Cause I, I have a smaller corn. I might try for that because okay. it's an orange. They called it in English an atomic orange corn. Hmm. Okay. But when you look it up, it's a Zuni corn that only grows like four feet tall uh -huh. and it's really bright orange. Okay. And I was thinking if I grew it in a bucket, I would probably have to grow it in one of those big rectangular buckets because if, th if you think about it, uh, south of the U.S., the Mexica had chinampas and they grew corn. Mm -hmm. in the chinambas they grew it in hydroponically well aquaponically because mm -hmm. there's fish in the, in the lake so if they can grow corn in water then so can we yeah totally Just what kind of setup setup i could make mm -hmm. probably be the giant i forgot what the name of those giant plastic containers that are like rectangular with wheels you get them from like ace hardware oh uh, i can't <laughs> i don't know, think like in case, <laughs> I don't know. Hmm. okay maybe cut cut circles in the top maybe yeah mm. yeah and then like have like a drain system you know so like i mean depending on like where you put it you know so that water kind of has a place to exit as well you know so i've seen mm -hmm. i've seen some pueblo farmers do it like that you know like if they just they mm -hmm. don't own land or if they don't uh just have like the manpower or they're limited to like like the body function, you know, disabled farmers more so. I see that's what they've done. You know, they get like big, like kind of like the water pans, like for livestock, and they fill it up with dirt from like the local community and they will plant oh. their crop in there. But at the bottom, they will like drill like little holes so that water has a way to kind of run out of it. And then, so it's not- Raised bed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, pretty much like a raised bed type of style. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. cool. <clears throat> I think I'm getting converted to the hydroponic. <laughs> sorry, I accidentally unmute. I'm sorry, my bad. It's okay. Um, about the hydroponics is that there's a lot less bugs when you use it. And when I'm, mm -hmm. I live in an apartment, in an apartment building, and I'm trying uh -huh. not to have bugs come, like fungus gnats. When you're growing indoor, fungus gnats is a mm -hmm. big problem. I'm having so many of them this week. I don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. And I realize that the, the places in my house with hydroponics have nothing. There's no bugs. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I'm sort of kind of getting converted because of that. And uh -huh. then I don't have those nematodes or anything that eats the roots. Yeah, totally. Know, so. And then it also doesn't, uh, with hydroponics, you don't have none of like those toxic weeds or other types of like grasses, mm -hmm. you know, that grow with the food and with the crop, you know, mm -hmm. in the dryland farming type of avenue you know so hydroponics seems to be a little bit more healthier you know and then it just mm -hmm. really functions well for the crops that you are growing grows quicker too mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. hi uh so i have like two questions the first one is about not really a question but i kind of want to hear your perspective on food storage traditional food storage and how that can elevate indigenous communities into the future in terms of our, our food sovereignty and uh, kind of relying a little less off the system. Um, and then my second question I'll ask later after you get to that one. Okay, yeah, like I think um, like benefits to like going back and utilizing like traditional ancestral food techniques is like first is like understanding, you know, utilizing those resources that you have, you know, that may be free, you know, because for a lot of uh, families, you know, it might, financial hardship might be a factor. So like just realizing what you do have uh, laying around or what um, free resources that you do have can really help with the, the preservation and the curing factors of it, but also the storage of it, you know, and one way that like 
to get us kind of out of like our current system or the hardships of it, you know, would be like, just like realizing that like our ancestors have done this, you know, like they, they found ways and methods to be able to make it happen and preserve food that uh, they were able to eat later on, you know, so like not being, thinking about like the idea that like we can overcome it, you know, like we, we have what's really be like readily available to us right now and utilizing as a as a measure to make sure that like we can continue using our ancestral roots that have been taught for us or that have been passed down to us and kind of break out of that systemic um ways where it's been very hard for a lot of people sorry i had to unmute myself <laughs> So yeah, I, I really appreciate that answer. I think a lot of us need to really start looking down that path and, and developing, you know, mm -hmm. like you were talking about before those roadways, we were constant, even though we did have tribal conflicts between tribe to tribe, um, more so than not, we also had a lot of, of you know, indigenous food roadways and, and mm -hmm. you know, these systems that we're talking about from either growing to storing and stuff like that can help us out in the long run with, uh, our, our food sovereignty, our agroeconomy and things like that. Um, but the second question I wanted to ask you was with regards to kind of um, settler veganism. Mm. A lot of times they kind of, the way they talk about our systems as is as if we didn't have knowledge. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I kind of like understood through watching your your class is that we are just even if we had foods come from far away we never practice permaculture or monocropping and so what winds up happening is that we have a diverse food palette that isn't harmful to the ecosystem or harmful to our communities and um so what i'm curious about is like how do you feel about you know kind of settler veganism that kind of finds an ethnic food uh, mm -hmm. let's say like blue corn or let's say now well they haven't discovered blue corn yet but like avocado almond something like that and then they kind of create like this monoculture uh and then they try to frame it as healthy ways or sustainable ways mm -hmm. i'm just curious about what you think about that being that your food system seems so tied into the the territories you're from yeah um my thoughts into that you know it's just like I mean, the the corn, you know, has been a very important crop, you know, to the people and even to like myself and the family. Um, and I, I just, you know, I don't think because of the Pueblo people and like just uh, different native nations and tribes have a very special connection to it. You know, I, I don't think that it's ever going to become such a big thing like it is with other food crops or species just because, you know, it's really culturally based to the indigenous people and like the history of it i just like my thoughts are like it's not going to be as big of like a monoculture or anything else like that with other groups you know just because there seems to be more of a line of respect for the idea of corn and what's given to the people of turtle island the native people of turtle island you know so i think um the idea of perspective or respect comes into play and not making it uh, a factor of like what you're talking about like with the veganism and stuff like that I think there's just that sign of respect for it okay I have one more question mm -hmm. uh, so how can we take what you taught us in the class and apply it to where we are if a bunch of us are urban mm -hmm. when we know that we need to consider climate change like what is what you taught mm -hmm. like how does that work as climate catastrophe is playing out right desertification and all of those things mm -hmm. Yeah, like totally, you know, like the past couple of years, you know, the, like my Pueblo, you know, we've seen how climate change has affected our preserving, curing and storage techniques, you know, because typically, you know, like in the fall months where we harvest, you know, we, we're so used to like seeing 
sun exposure, you know, we're seeing good like a weather pattern that we've seen for very long times, you know, but the past couple of years, you know, it's starting to dif differentiate and the ways that we have kind of adapted to it is just like kind of the idea of timing, you know, like looking at it, like when, when you pick or when you harvest and like the certain period of time you have, you know, to make sure that like you get a good, uh, the, the, the food is cured enough before you expect any rain or any snow to come through, you know, and then also the idea of frost, you know, like that's one thing that climate change has really came in towards like combating with the, the Pueblo farmers is like typically in October or even late September when harvest is happening, um, that's very perfect weather, you know, but the past couple of years, you know, those cold fronts are starting to come in and frosting out all of their crop. Mm one way like i think that for uh, for uh, a lot of like say urban um farmers and like a lot of people who are trying to retouch and like redevelop their ancestral roots and uh, techniques is just like uh understanding you know is just that weather pattern of it but also like looking into I guess for me it would be like utilizing those tech, the technology that we do have now is like, how can we use that as a, an advancement or as a benefactor to make sure that we're still practicing like our traditional storage techniques, but like we can also bring in the idea of tech, technology advancements, you know? So maybe like, um, I don't know, like even like a food dehydrator, I've seen like, I know I've, some, I've seen some families have used that, you know? in terms of like preserving their foods for a longer period of time, especially those, uh, the veggies and the fruits of it. So I, like I said, I think the idea of utilizing and transitioning into technology would be a good way to approach it and step forward. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that was a very insightful response. <laughs> I don't know what I was expecting, but wow, that was a good answer. Um, we have a question from the chat from Heather. Okay. I'm putting bugs into my seeds as well. Do you have any suggestions for no bugs in seed bins? Should she use bay leaf? Mm, interesting. What we tend to use, you know, for us is uh, in the Pueblo specifically is like the um, breaking off a branch of like the cedar because it's such a pungent smell and it like it really, especially if it's in an enclosed area, you know, it really drives off or wards off any type of bugs, insects, or anything that like want to come into it. So I think cedar, you know, because of its strong smell could possibly help. And that's, that's what has helped for us in the Pueblo, so specifically my family. Um, we just break off a branch and then we, we kind of throw it in there with the food, you know, because um, eventually, you know, when we want to use that food to cook, you know, we, we clean it we still run it through like the water, make sure like there's no bacteria or no mold on it, but like that cedar seems to work very well, you know, uh, maybe bay leaves might work as well. Uh, I have never heard of uh, any family who has used that, but I would recommend something with a very like strong pungent smell and like kind of throw it in there with the, uh, in a storage unit and that might draw, draw off some bugs. Makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. It's also good because cedar does smell good and the oil is not bad for you, so. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, well, we'll leave it open for just a, one more question. Does anyone have any questions? I'm gonna also check um, the class group and see if anyone has questions in the chat because sometimes people do ask those things. So hang on one second. Yeah. Again, Mark, can I ask again another question? Please do. Because I have so many questions about the storage because I really am having problems with my storage right now. Um, and I'm looking for the ideal way to store the seeds. So I'm so um, uh, admire the, the big clay, the beautiful clay um, bins. And I'm kind of wondering, because right now I have them all in little plastic bags and obviously mm -hmm. the Bags, I think the bugs can get into. And I like that Deb Echo Hawk talked about like these other plastic containers with a got a good sealable lid. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering when you have those big clay containers, are you putting just one seed type in each clay bin mm -hmm. or can you wrap them in fabric cloth or something to somehow put many different seeds in the bin? I'm just curious to know how you do it because. Okay. 
Yeah, um, typically, you know, they try to keep like one species per bin, you know, they don't want to kind of mix it up, you know, and I know what I've also seen is like, because a lot of these potteries or like these open containerized pots that don't have lids, people will cover it up, you know, because sometimes um, air exposure could be, could be also bad and harmful to the seed, you know, especially those that uh, or that easily sprout to any type of moisture and water or heat, you know? So the way I've seen it is like the, in potteries that uh, some families still use, you know, like they, they keep one species to pot, but then they like kind of mm -hmm. saran wrap it or something to kind of enclose and keep that air inside of it. And then every time they open it up, they make sure they like, they uh, air seal lock it again. So um, like I said, air could sometimes be a bad thing as well. Mm -hmm. But yeah, any type of like closed container or seal lock type of like lid seems to be the very like the best way to do it. You know, if that's in like a Tupperware, in a pot, in a barrel or even in a pottery, you know, like those those are the best way to approach it. <clears throat> Uh oh, Desiree muted. Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> I just had one last question. Um, mm -hmm. I currently reside in the state of Idaho, to be more spe specific, the city of Boise. And compared to where I was just two weeks ago, the state of Washington, the air is significantly drier and mm -hmm. it tends to get around 109, 100, uh, 110 degrees during the, the harshest parts of, of summer. My inquiry to you is this. Would would it like this be perfect for for storage as of as opposed to say Seattle? Okay. <laughs> In that regard. Uh huh. So, like, typically, when would you start seeing that fall to winter transition up in Idaho? Like, what like around what? around late October. Late October. Okay. So, like, say if you like were to harvest your crop in like September, like mid September or something. You at least mm -hmm. get like at least a one month kind of like curing or preservation process and then store it I think that will work you know sometimes one month might it's just kind of like a, a, a over time kind of budget you know like just have a little cushion room mm -hmm. uh, but I feel like right before that winter fall winter kind of transition comes will be the best time to make sure that you have all your food stored or like or fully cured and then stored inside a dry cool area you know because you don't want to keep your food out while you start seeing snow come down you know that's going to be bad <laughs> no, cause, cause that would definitely be bad spoilage <laughs> and then like cause like mildew and mold so um ideally you know like most farmers in the southwest from the pueblo people i've seen you know try to at least start harvesting by mid-september so it gives them at least a one month window to cure and preserve the food take it off like the, the, the cob or take it off and chop it up and then preserve it and store it in, in the units. Thank you very, very much. Mm -hmm. Of course, thank you. Hi. Okay. Uh, hi, my name's Dick Echohawk and um, I had a question, interesting question to me the other day Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, the question I had the other day was uh, shelf life. Oh, and uh, we haven't had a, a tro any trouble with our, our crops because uh, we tend to get, uh, get them distributed or sold, uh, sold out. Um, and uh, but but I was curious as as what what you think about uh, the shelf life of, of corn, corn like, like in a meal stage. So you're asking about the shelf life of like corn meal and or just corn in general. I I couldn't really hear you too well. Uh, corn meal specifically, uh, corn in general that's shelled. Okay. Um, yeah, like the shelf life, honestly, you know, like if the corn is fully cured and dried out, you know, like it will 
tend to last for a very long time. You know, like I myself, you know, I I carry like a pouch of cornmeal with me, you know, and that was from the harvest of the 2018 season. So um, as long as like, you know, like the idea of the curing and the preservation techniques are done right and like it's fully cured, you know, like and then the seed is nice and dry. Um, the cornmeal, you know, once you blend it into cornmeal for, for prayer, for food, it seems to last a very long time. And that also goes for blue corn as well or even uh, other type of like colored corn that like some tribes uh, also blend down for foods as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Deb, I'm surprised that you have questions actually, because James, Deb, Deb Echo Hawk is like seed preservationist extraordinaire. Uh, okay. Grandmother. So. <laughs> awesome. Well, yeah, I mean, we we get our corn and it goes like hotcakes, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh -huh. but I was asked the question be about that, and I I know like with our painted like a horse beans, um, you know, when we cook them up and they're from 2014, they still taste really good. Mm -hmm. You know, so I, I when that question was asked for me, uh, I just thought, well, okay, I can ask that question mm -hmm. of others. <laughs> okay, well, I do appreciate the question. Thank you. Okay, any last minute questions or comments? Otherwise, we will uh, wrap up class here. Brooke? No, I just want to thank uh, James for coming on and teaching us about um, his uh, region's culture and his people and, and sharing his family's uh, stories because food is very personal and it's very communal and uh, it's sacred in that way and it ties us it it's what ties us to the land it was, it's what gives us our indigeneity mm -hmm. so I just want to thank you for sharing those things with us it was my pleasure you know it's truly an honor you know being able to like, expand you know from what I was able to learn for like from my from my uncles and my grandpa, you know, and they kind of just sharing it with the room, you know, I'm um, very thankful to be given this opportunity, you know, it's, it's not every day, you know, that I, I get to do this. And when this opportunity came up, I was just so thrilled with it because I, I am a true believer in the cross cultural exchange of ideas and what work, what, what has worked for many different tribes and nations because we're, we're all like one people, you know, that for so long there have been barriers. We have never really cooperated or just worked with each other. So I am truly honored to be uh, on this call and teaching that lesson today. Thank you, James. Mm -hmm. All right, everyone. Well, have a wonderful week. Have a wonderful evening. We'll catch you next Thursday. Please let people know if you liked this presentation to join the Facebook group. You know, word of mouth is a big thing and it's helpful um, to have people participate in the class. It also just makes uh, interesting community with one another. So um, yeah, thank you and have a good night. All right. Good night, thank everybody. You. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, James. Yeah, of course.